And um, it's a really exciting fungus to work with. There's lots of different um, aspects to its biology and different stages of the life cycle that one could look into. And so instead of just talking about my research for the whole time, I thought I would go back and tell you some interesting stories that have happened um, throughout uh, its discovery up until modern day. And so I'll cover three stories. The first one is the quest to identify a mystery fungus. The second one is the discovery of a unique case of mimicry. And the third is the battle with an agricultural care. And that's what I worked on. And so we'll start with the quest to identify a mystery fungus. And in order to tell the story, I'm going to use a little time machine. <laughs> uh, take you back to 1908, where the story begins, with a man named John M. Reed. He was a plant pathologist studying at Cornell. He was getting his PhD, and he worked with the family's Claritinaceae. Does anyone know what the Claritinaceae is? Perhaps? They're not really uh, fungi that you find in the woods too much, but they're um, really important plant pathogens. And so uh, this is Monolinea fructigena on cherries, a really big plant pathogen, economically important. Uh, this is botrytis on grapes. Uh, it has a really big impact on the wine industry. <coughs> and then white mold of beans. This is caused by Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. And this is actually a sclerotinia that infects camellias. It's, or actually not a sclerotinia, it's a sclerotiniaceae, but it's a cyberinia, which infects camellias. And so Reed found this new mystery fungus and he wasn't sure what to call it. And so, uh, surely, he looked back at the sclerotinias that he had been looking at in his work with the sclerotiniaceae and started to look for some taxonomic features that uh, could be used to identify it. And so, uh, other fungi in the sclerotin sclerotiniaceae include sclerotinia sclerotiorum. And uh, does anyone know what an apothecium is? So, this is an apothecium. Apothecium. And that's, this is actually much like a mushroom uh, for the um, Ascomycota. So a lot of the mushrooms we've been looking at here have been in the Pisidio mycota. This is in the Ascomycota, typically a lot smaller. And this is their little fruiting structure. So it's a cup, and it's lined with spores. And the spores are called ascospores. They have sexual spores for this fungus. And they're typically wind disseminated. So the cup comes up, and then wind blows through and takes the spores away. And so we have an apothecium, and this bottom part is called a sclerotium. And a sclerotium is from the Greek skleros, and it's actually just a really hardened ball of fungal tissue. And the reason that a lot of fungi produce it is that it helps them get through tough parts of the year. So particularly winter, they tend to form the sclerotium, they harden, and uh, it has food reserves in it, and they stay like that throughout the winter, and then when when conditions are more conducive, then they'll start their life cycle, another part of their life cycle. And so, yes, Sclerotinia sclerotiorum, Sclerotinia minor, Sclerotinia baratri, with its apothecium and its sclerotium. And so he looked at this mystery fungus, and based on the apothecium and an apparent sclerotium, he called it Sclerotinia vaccinii cornhosi. And this is the first time, 1908, that this fungus was ever named. And so, um, let me fast forward to 1936, we had a new plant pathologist called Edwin E. Honey, and he was very interested in this mystery fungus and wanted to do more work on it. And so he looked at it, and he thought that it should be uh, in a different group, still in the Sclerotiniaceae, but he thought it should have its entirely own genus and he wanted to call it Monolinea vaccinii gormbosi. And this is the first time the word Monolinea had ever been used for a genus. And he based it off of the apothecium. So like many other fungi in Sclerotiniaceae, it's still producing apothecium, but he called this hardened structure a pseudosclerotium. And the difference between the two is that while a sclerotium is just pure hyphae or fungal material that's hardened together, a pseudosclerotium usually incorporates maybe pebbles or dirt or plant tissue. And so this one was doing something a little bit different. But also in the genus that he wanted to create, there were some other characteristics that he defined. And so one of them were these light colored spores. They're lemon-shaped and they're see-through. 
Another one is that every species that he put into this genus was plant pathogenic. And so uh, fungi, as many of you know, I'm sure, can inhabit all different places on the planet. There's fungi that infect amphibians, fungi that infect mammals, humans. Uh, there's fungi that are only marine, fungi that infect algae, fungi that are only freshwater. And so this is pretty specific, that every species that he wanted to put into this genus was a plant pathogen, or specifically attacked plants. In addition to this, he did something very interesting. He took the genus and then he separated it into two groups. And so he called it the junctoriae and the disjunctoriae. And so um, how many people know that fungi can have like sexual spores and then asexual spores? Yeah, so the sexual spores were produced in that apothecium, but these are the asexual spores. They're called conidia. And they're typically formed like this. They're formed one after another, kind of in a chain, like a, like a string of pearls or something. And um, one conidium will grow alongside another, and they'll push against each other um, more and more and more as they grow, and the pressure between them will increase until they kind of burst apart and rupture. And that's kind of how they get disseminated into the wind and then they're carried off. But he saw that there were some fungi that were doing something a little bit different. They have these little connectors in between them. And he wasn't sure why they were being formed there. He hadn't seen them before, um, but he thought that maybe it had something to do with their dissemination. That maybe it was making uh, the connection between them a little bit more brittle, more easily broken off, but it was a mystery. He just noted it and moved on. And then he noted another important characteristic, was, which was that a lot of them in the disjunctoriae uh, the ones with the disjunctors didn't know how they were dispersed. A lot of them also produced a sweet smell when they were cultured. And uh, most things in biota don't produce things like this for no reason. So there's probably some sort of reason why they were using their energy to produce a sweet smell. Um, but he didn't know. And so that kind of concludes that first part. He, uh, we have monolinea being named. We have it being classified into its own genus. Uh, some of the characteristics start to come up. Um, and that brings us to our next little story, which is the case of mimicry. And this is super interesting to me. It's one of my favorite parts about millennia. And so, we'll go back to 1984 with L.R. Batra. And he's a plant pathologist that was working on the East Coast. And since 1936, only a few plant pathologists had worked with monolinia, just uh, one publication here and there, but not a lot was done. And so L.R. Batra wanted to take every known monolinia from around the world, because they're big form all around the world, he wanted to compile all that information, and then he wanted to learn much more about the biology. And so while he was learning about different monolinias, he got interested in mummy berries, and that's the disease that I work on. And so, as we said before, it's in the family Sclerotiniaceae. That was decided in 1908. It's in the genus Monolinea, the subgroup Disjunctoriae uh, species, Saxiniae cornbosi, and it infects blueberries. And so, he was looking at the life cycle of Monolinea Saxiniae cornbosi and had an idea. So, I'll go through the life cycle real quick and we'll discuss this. So, we'll start down here at the bottom with a pseudosclerotium. And uh, in a blueberry field, it'll rest on the blueberry orchard floor from the late summer all the way up until early spring. And it's just kind of sitting there, not really doing much um, to the untrained eye. Uh, and then in early spring, it will produce an apothecium. So it has ascospores, the cup will open, wind comes through the blueberry orchard and picks them up. And this is perfectly timed with blueberry bud break. And so that's when blueberry um, branches, the tissue starts to open, the scales start to open, uh, and they will form both leaf tissue and flowers later on. But at this point, they're very susceptible to disease. And so any spores that get picked up and contact that tissue will cause disease. And disease looks a bit like this. So once those leaves start to develop, the flowers start to develop, it'll cause drooping, it'll cause a brownish color, and it'll cause a mat of spores to start to be formed right there. And then uh, another note about this is that this is the disjunctoria, and so the spores that you just saw have the little disjunctors in there, and that, was, that has a mystery 
uh, dispersal. We don't really know how they're being dispersed, but we know they have these structures. And so he was interested in that. And he knew that somehow they get from here, from the diseased plant tissue, to healthy flowers. But he didn't know how. Um, after they get onto the healthy flower, they land on the stigma, and then they grow down the style and into the ovary. And then whenever the flower is fertilized, fruit will start to grow. You can cut them open and see mycelium growing yeah. inside of the fruit. And it'll grow out and out and out until it takes over the entire berry and become its own pseudosclerotia. And so when we're normally seeing healthy blueberries, we can also see these pseudosclerotia for the flowers that were uh, colonized. So if anyone does any you pick, you've probably seen some. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah. And uh, so in late summer, then they'll drop off the bush and they'll sit on the ground again from late summer until early spring and start that cycle over again. And so he wanted to know specifically how these spores were being taken from the diseased tissue to the healthy flowers to start that next part of the disease cycle. And so he thought about that sweet smell in the culture and he started thinking about uh, how pollinators seem to be attracted to fruit, to sweet smells. And he wondered if the sweet smell that was being uh, emitted by the diseased tissue could potentially trick a pollinator into thinking that it was a healthy flower and maybe the pollinator would come visit. And so the evidence of photomimicry at this point was pretty sparse. We had a sweet smell and a good. <coughs> and so I wanted to add some more information to that. So he set up an experiment. He took blueberry bushes and before the flowers had opened, he would bag some of the branches and then leave other branches open to pollinators. Okay, so at this point, all of the flowers are closed inside of the bags. No pollinators have visited them yet. And then he goes and he collects completely clean pollen. So the way you do this is you take some branches that have not opened, you bring them inside and allow them to open inside without any pollinators visiting them, collect that pollen, and then you hand pollinate every flower. He did this and he found 10% diseased fruit for the ones that no pollinators had visited and 63% diseased fruit on the ones that were open pollinated. So it was pretty clear that something was going on here with the pollinators. But he wanted to be more thorough than that. He also found that sucrose, fructose, and glucose was being emitted by this fungus in the diseased parts. And he noted that vaccinium flowers tend to produce 20% glucose and 80% fructose and sucrose. In addition to this, he found that the same area was reflecting UV light. And so um, hymenoptera, or bees, can see into the ultraviolet spectrum. How many people know about, like nectar guides? Yeah. Yeah, so we might be looking at a flower and see this, but if we could see into the ultraviolet spectrum, we would see this. And this is actually a very common bullseye. It's um, a guide so that bees know exactly where to land so that they can more efficiently gather pollen and sugars. We might see this, and a pollinator might see this. And so, yeah, directing them exactly to where they need to go. So at this point, he had increased the, uh, the number of pieces of evidence for floral mimicry from the sweet smell to also having a sugary reward and to providing these ultraviolet reflective patterns analogous to nectar guides. But there was another um, piece of the puzzle that was also brought to us. So besides just seeing that pollinators were moving spores in 1996, someone wanted to look at this part of the life cycle. What was happening when the chlamydia landed on the stigma and went into the ovary? It was kind of unknown what was happening there. We knew that it was going into the flower somehow, somehow getting into the fruit, but other than that, it was kind of unknown. And so some scientists named T.C. Shenners and Era Olson found that hyphae would actually traverse the same canals as a pollen tube. And so most fungi, when they hit a substrate, will grow out in a highly branched pattern. Like um, if you look at bread mold, you'll see that it's like fuzzy and kind of random and yeah, highly branched. But this fungus has evolved to grow unidirectionally. And so it hits that stigma and it just, it intercepts the same signaling and it grows down the exact same pathway that a um, pollen tube might grow. And another thing that's really interesting about this is that this picture is not Monolinea vaccinia carnbosi. 
It's actually Claviceps purpurea. Um, and this is a fungus that's in a completely different family. And so what we're seeing here is that two fungi that are very, very distantly related have evolved a very similar uh, tactic for colonizing a host, that by kind of tricking it into thinking that it's pollen, it's able to infiltrate the flower and fulfill its life cycle. And so after this, there were quite a few pieces of evidence for floral mimicry. We had our sweet smell, our sugary reward, our ultraviolet patterns, and now that the hypey were responding to the signaling and traversing the same pathway as the pollen grain itself. So uh, that brings us to the battle with an agricultural terror, what I've been working on for the last three years. And so we're going to go back to 1969, British Columbia. Um, a lot of blueberries are grown in British Columbia, and during this year, they experienced an 8.1% crop loss just from this fungus. Uh, not even thinking about frost damage or sun damage or any other possible pest, insect, 8.1% crop loss and $750,000 in, in damage. A few years later, in New Hampshire, a 70 to 85% crop loss. That's um, terrible for a farmer who makes his whole living off of this crop. And then in 1981, it happened again in Nova Scotia. Um, so we're having these really big epidemics of mummyberry and not much control. We have right now a modern list. Oh, yeah, it was being caused by mummyberry. But yeah, we have this modern list of uh, control methods that we can use. So we have conventional. And conventional agriculture is more so um, synthetic fungicides. And then we have some cultural controls, but there's drawbacks from both. So if you go the conventional route, you have to worry about environmental degradation, but you also have to worry about resistance. Does anyone know about fungicide resistance? Yeah. If you use the same fungicide over and over again, you're selecting for the fungi that aren't uh, bothered by it or don't die from it. And so uh, those become more prevalent, and then you have to create new pesticides and start using those. Um, but with cultural methods, there's drawbacks to those, like you have to layer them one on top of the other. And even then, you don't get um, a great amount of control. And so, back in 1974, a plant pathologist named R.B. Mulholland was doing some biological research on this fungus and found two very interesting pieces of information. He took a pseudosclerotium and he buried it one inch below the soil surface in a laboratory and found that no apothecia came up that he could do this. He also took a pseudosclerotium and exposed it to zero light and found that no apothecia were produced. And uh, this was a pretty amazing discovery because it was something that could be used to develop some type of control method. But unfortunately, uh, since then, no one had done anything with this research. People read it and they were like, oh, that's nice. Um, maybe we could cultivate our soil, but there was no research done outside and no one really knew how it would even, if it would even react the same way if we did it outside. And so, moving forward to 2011, I came to Oregon State University. And um, I knew that I wanted to work in sustainable agriculture, and I knew that I wanted to work with mycology. And so I was told about Modalinia vaccinii corymbosi, and I started doing research on it, and found out that this research had been done in 1974, and no one had followed up on it ever since. And so I decided that I would take the same um, idea of burial but here in Oregon, most farmers actually mulch. They mulch on top of the soil instead of cultivating, since blueberries are very shallowly rooted. And so I took the same concept, um, but I wanted to also incorporate that light aspect, which you'll see in just a moment. And I wanted to do it in an outdoor field location to see how it was working in the natural environment, natural ecosystems, temperature fluctuations, and see if we got the same results. And so what I did was I took a quantum meter, and it's actually um, a tool that will help you uh, measure light intensity. So you're not looking at anything about wavelengths, just how intense is light. And then I added various mulches on top of it in incremental layers until I got a depth that had zero light coming through. 
right? Because no Holland said that zero light, you should get no apothecia. He also said one inch should cause no apothecia. And so I did this until I got a zero reading. And uh, I found that our most common mulch, which is Douglas fir sada, at one inch had a zero light reading. And so that was pretty interesting that the one inch that he had talked about plus the no light, when those were placed together, they, they coincided. One inch stopped apothecia from occurring, no light stops, no, stops apothecia from occurring. And so I put those together and I wanted to put those into a field trial, but I needed another piece of information. So I know how deep the mulch needs to be. I know that that depth will exclude light, but I also need to know at what point during the year it needs to be applied for farmers to be able to use it. And so I thought about this timing and wanted it to coincide with something biological instead of just saying a fall mulch, because a fall mulch might be different in Oregon than it is in Georgia, or certainly will be different. And so I looked at the life cycle and recognized that this part where the pseudosclerotium falls onto the ground and is there from late summer until early spring, uh, it's kind of vague and kind of broad and hadn't really been defined. And so I redefined um, many stages within this larger, more broad stage. And so I broke it up into maturation, and that's when our normal blueberries are, are uh, mature. That's when we would have harvest, but our diseased mummies are still on the bush, and they tend to fall down at this point. I also have dormancy, and that's when they start to shed this outer blueberry skin and reveal the pseudosclerotium beneath. There's also germination. And so um, this whole period where it looks like they're doing nothing, they're actually sensing both cold and warm and rain. And after a certain amount of chill hours, they'll start to produce these little horns. And they're pretty brittle. Uh, they don't seem like much is happening, but um, this occurs. And then as you get more chill, they actually begin to elongate even more, even though they're hard and brittle. And then in late winter, when we start getting longer days, maybe the temperatures start getting a little bit warmer as we get closer to spring, they'll start to get fleshy and differentiate. Uh, the tip starts to look different than the base. And then with a few more warm days, we get them opening up and forming their fruiting bodies. And so I used this timing and um, I, I put it together with the mulch depth that excludes light my timing based on biological changes and an outdoor location, and formed a very large experiment outdoors. Um, it looks a bit overwhelming, but what it is is every block that you see is an individual blueberry bush. Okay. And it's grouped. Every four blueberry bushes is a little group. And so say the first one, this one that's all blue, they would all get a mulch at this stage. When, they're, when the mummies look like this and they've fallen off of the bush, that's when they get a mulch. And then the next stage would be when the skin comes off and they're black, mm -hmm. then they get another mulch. And so every time I put a mulch down, I give um, a mulch that is one inch of Douglas fir sawdust, two inches of Douglas fir sawdust, uh, just leaves, and then nothing on top of them. And it's repeated six times, but I'm not going to think about that too much. Yes. And this is what it looks like in the field. So underneath the blueberry bush, there'll be a little thing that I call a corral uh -huh. with a certain number of pseudosclerotia in it, and then it gets mulched on top of it. And what I found was this. So this is the number of apothecia that we get uh, in one spot if we don't do anything at all. This is if leaves fall down on top of them, and this is if, say, you rake the leaves away. So are the leaves the blueberry leaves? Yes. Okay. Yep. So blueberries are deciduous. They drop their leaves in the fall. And so I looked at this is if the leaves stay there. This is if the leaves are removed. But basically not doing anything to the mummies. And this is what happens if you mulch. In comparison, this is very statistically significant. And then even further, if you look at the timing, as you go further into winter, if you mulch at like in midwinter, you get no apothecia at all in this experiment. And so it was showing that mulching can actually be a cultural control method and a very effective one at that. That's really cool, because I've noticed in my own blueberries, I always try to mulch 
just before bark break. Mm -hmm. and, and that fits with that. That's a perfect timing, yeah. yeah. As long as you get it right, right. before yeah. bud break, mm -hmm. yes. And so uh, the impact of this is that I would be able to add another control method to the list that's already been created. So the mulching of mummified fruit during midwinter. And that this could be a cultural control method that could be used for conventional farmers, for organic agriculture, even for no spray. And it can help decrease reliance on pesticides for people that would like to, but can also be used um, just in any, any type of setting, even if you wanted to use uh, conventional sprays. And so with that, we talked about the quest to identify mystery fungus, the discovery of the UK, unique case of number three, and my battle with an agricultural terror, which has been a really great time. And I will take any questions that you have. This happens on huckleberries too, doesn't it? Yes. Yep, Monolinea gangus ACA is a natural Monolinea. Well, I mean, they're all natural, but this one occurs like out in forests. And yeah, it will mummify uh, huckleberry fruit. Uh -huh. I actually found some at Cape Perpetua. Have you ever seen it on yes. the coast here? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot. So What's the mm -hmm. species, species of the, for that? For, uh, it's Monolinea gangus ACA, is the Monolinea that's on huckleberry. Yes. Any other questions? So when you did your experiment and you put the mummy berries down on the ground, did you gather those from the same blueberry plant so they were all? Yes. So I actually have a collaborator who has a blueberry farm and they have a problem with mummy berry. And the way that they deal with mummy berry is that whenever they harvest, they also harvest all of those mummies. Mm -hmm. And so they already have to sort them. So they sort them into little piles and I can pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And who? Yeah. I don't think I should say who okay. has a mummy berry problem. I, I so, but are they just raking? You maybe do. Are they just raking? So that's one way that people do it, but the more efficient way is to gather them as they harvest. So whenever they're harvesting healthy berries, they just also harvest the mummies, and then they go in and they sort, and they sort for all the different types oh, of okay. things, like sunburn, and yeah, then they give me mummies, and then my mom helps me sort them for my research. <laughs> <laughs> You're vicious. Yes? Are mummy berries toxic? No. You could eat them, but they're not good. Okay. <laughs> they taste like How do I know? Uh, I watched my boss eat one. <laughs> I eat a lot of by accident. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty hard and chalky and, yeah, not that great. So how far were the sexual spores um, traveled to infect uh, these bugberries at all So it's possible for them to travel very, very long distances just because they get into the wind and if they get carried up and up and up, they could get carried, you know, to the other side of America, if possible. But there has been experiments done on the epidemiology of the fungus and how it's transported. And it's found that most spores travel downwind. Most of the sexual spores travel downwind about 50 feet. But what's interesting is that the conidia, those secondary spores that are vectored by pollinators, they actually mostly travel upwind, which makes sense because pollinators tend to have an upwind flight pattern. Wow. Yeah. So how, for it to be effective agricultural practice, how far away do you have to be from neighbors that don't do anything? Oh, that is a good question. Um, if a neighbor doesn't do anything and you're downwind of them, that is an issue. Uh, but it, that's a hard one to get at. It's more, it's, I guess it's a lot about uh, doing outreach and making sure that everyone knows that at least this technique could be used. And in addition to that, mulching is already a very common practice with blueberries. Uh, it helps with water retention and it helps with increasing organic matter. So pretty much everyone that I've met who grows blueberries in Oregon will mulch them. Unless it's like a home, a home operation. Oh, yes. So the big blueberry farms that have the 70% loss. Do they, do they do any kind of mulching where they um, were at, or is that just a totally different practice? Well, so those were a really long time ago, and I actually don't have data on what their practices were in order for that to happen. Um, I would assume that, uh, like, the first one that we talked about in British Columbia, it affected so many different farmers that you get a grab bag of some people were mulching and some people weren't, but some people were probably spraying something. Yeah, but it still affects many farms even when they do spray. 
and the organic sprays that have been developed tend to not work very well. Sometimes they don't work any better than a control, which is nothing. Sometimes. Yes? The picture with the little frog, do you think he's eating some of the um, mycelium or anything? I think he's just hanging out because it's green and it's a safe place to be. <laughs> I would think. Um, and I know you said that uh, there's a similar one for cranberries, mm -hmm. and is there, have you noticed any similarity of the transport of it, because they grow in a much wetter, I mean, uh, commercially I know they're grown in a much wetter environment, so are they, do you know if it's a similar problem for the cranberry? It's not in as big of a problem in cranberry, but I haven't read any research about how it's actually uh, vectored in cranberry, um, but if I don't know too much about cranberry production, but I thought that cranberries were sometimes grown dry and then flooded the field for harvest specifically. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in that case, well, I'm not sure. It might be that the flooding of the field actually decreases the problem automatically because pseudosclerotia or mummies, they're called both, um, they don't do very well when they're flooded for long periods mm. of time. It actually greatly decreases their viability. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is, is there a difference in the quality of the fur um, mulch? Um, is in it pretty consistent? A fur is a fur. For um, disease management or just in general for farmers? Um, I guess both. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, it tends to just be this byproduct that comes from the timber industry. They usually get it untreated. Um, I haven't really looked into what testing it, testing it specifically and figuring out how different their Douglas fir is. I just know that many farmers already use Douglas fir. That's the most common one that's in Northwest. And so that's the one that I used also. But I will probably um, broaden it and look at other mulches too and uh, see if there continues to be a correlation between uh, the type of mulch and the depth that you would need based on how much light would come through it, if that makes sense. So a bark mulch would have more space for light to come through, so I would expect that you would need a deeper mulch for that. Yes? So does um, the Canadian sage or um, in, in the leaves, mm -hmm. is, is that does that overwinter also so that you, you should cut the, the shoots off? And, mm -hmm. I mean, is that, what's, what's the cycle of that? How would you treat that? Yeah, so it doesn't last for more than one year. So all disease for that one year has to come from the ground, has to come from that pseudosclerotium that overwinters. And um, that's actually part of the, the research a little bit, is that, uh, or the idea of the research, is that if you get it at this one point, this is the starting point of the whole epidemic. So if we stop it then, we can kind of stop the whole thing, unless force comes from someone else's part. So botrytis in grapes is different, so it's in the Sclerotinaceae also, but botrytis is, let's see, it's called a weak pathogen, and what a weak pathogen is, is that it gets, okay, so first of all, botrytis doesn't have a sexual stage that we see outdoors very much. Sometimes we see it in a lab, but yeah, it's called botrytis, that's its asexual name, because that's what we see the most. But um, it's called a weak pathogen, because the way that it infects plants is that it uh, finds weak, dying tissue, and it'll infect that first, and then get enough energy to infect the healthy plant. And so, yeah, it's a very different type of um, disease cycle that botrytis goes through. But it's a really huge problem on grapes. And on roses. If you ever look, have roses and look at them, you'll, you'll find botrytis on those, too. Any other questions? Yeah. I had heard that um, native bumblebees are not attracted to the chlamydia, that sweetness, the mimicry, so they're not as fooled as honeybees are. Is that true or not true? So the research that was done by El Arbatra was actually on the East Coast, and he found that their native honeybees were attracted to it. That's on his list of the pollinators that he saw contacting chlamydia, but no one's done any further research on 
how attracted that they are, or um, like there's all these experiments that you could do where you could take them, take pollinators into a lab and see if they can learn to associate uh, a certain smell with a sweet reward and if they'll learn to start visiting more based on that reward, but no one's done that work yet. Is Mummy Berry new to the Willamette Valley? It seems like problems have increased over the last 20 years, particularly the last 10 years. That might be more because of increased acreage yeah. than it is because, yeah, because it's moved in. It's been here for quite some time. But yeah, I think um, the increase in production and then just over time it builds up. So it starts out very low. And so even you see it with one farm, just looking at one farm. They'll start out with very low levels of mummy berry, they'll hardly even notice it, they won't really worry about it, and it'll be there for years, and they won't worry about it, and then this one year we'll have a very conducive environmental condition in early spring, and it'll just skyrocket, and then it'll be one their biggest problem from that point on. So what are the weather conditions that promote the mummy berry? Uh, so, we want, or it wants. <laughs> we don't want. <laughs> yeah, I want. <laughs> um, uh, cool temperatures, lots of rain. Um, yeah, those are the two main ones. So temperatures around 10 degrees Celsius, from 9 to 12 is its happiest point. And it wants that for a very long time, and lots of rain during that period. So if we have a spring that, especially in... March, so I guess that's late winter, very early spring. If we have very little rain during that time, it's not going to be a bad disease year. It's going to be good. Yeah, it'll be bad for me and my research, but it'll be good for our <laughs> awesome. It's hard to talk about it because I, what I like is not good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to also... But you said a lot of water is a problem. Too much yeah. water is a problem. Yes. So, what's interesting about that is that if they get submerged and don't have access to oxygen, then they die. But they want to be on the soil surface where water can come past, come past them, and then they can draw up the amount of water that they want without being completely submerged in it. Yeah, so they're pretty finicky about what they want. Any other questions? I love blueberries, <laughs> and I love working on, well, I work on, like, a bunch of different perennial fruits, so I work, work on apples and grapes and peaches and uh, blueberries, of course. I also work on hazelnuts, and so I get free fruit every summer. Yay. So, yes, I like fruit a lot. <laughs>